time. Okay. I always feel really goofy with the microphone. Okay, this feels really awkward because you're only this far away, but apparently we have to use these anyway, so. Um, apparently. Yep, there we go. Cool. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm Jessica, and I am a teacher at Buller High School, which is up in Westport. I teach digital technology, maths, and business studies. I also run our robotics group, our code club group, and my history is in business analysis and project management. So I've worked in IT before. And we're all here with Vicky. <laughs> Um, and I'm Vicky Roadley. Um, my um, role has been in tertiary education, so a little bit different, I guess, to Jessica's background. I'm not quite as techy as her either. Um, a lot of the work that we've done in um, tertiary has been around, or just starting to use Zoom rooms, so we've been able to stream to some of our smaller areas um, and have classrooms that are shared, so we have one teacher and they might move around the site. So that's some of the experience I've had with some of the rural areas. I've also done a little bit of work with um, agriculture and doing the same sort of thing, trying to get um, training out um, to those areas that have some challenges around uh, mobile data and all those sorts of things as well. So I'm just gonna kick off with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, one of the things that we need to do, obviously, is use microphones. So I'm going to um, come around and, and hand you one of those when you want to say something. It's um, designed to be really um, open and we want everybody to have um, a say. So if someone's saying a whole lot and I see someone else waving, I'm going to kind of be a little bit rude and come in and grab, <laughs> grab the microphone and pass it on to the next person because we've only got an hour. So I'm really conscious that that's, um, you know, that the time will tick by and so to get everyone to have a chance. There's also um, the... Um, Google Docs where you can add any thoughts to either during um, or after as well. So um, if you think of some links or someone says something and you, someone else is interested, it'd be really good to get that link up as well. So, um, and just in, in terms of really boring stuff, um, if there's an emergency, our point of, um, of collection, I guess, is out the front where you buy the coffee cart there. So I'm going to ask Jessica to kick off. All right. Off. Yes. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, let's find out um, where you are all, I guess, based in terms of education, because we're doing looking at education and technology relating to that. So um, if you are in tertiary education, raise your hand. Oh, awesome. Um, if you're in secondary or primary? Yeah, kind of, you're not sure? <laughs> Oh, well, uh, what, what, does, what does it not mean? Everyone that comes close. Yep, no, that means you're in. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, if you are from business or industry? No. Where, where are your other folks from? Oh. I work in government. Yep, that's okay, we still like you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, where are you? <laughs> Sorry, chorus? Okay, cool. And where are you guys from? You're from here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm here from TPP, um, but I also have my own business training lecturers and guides overseas. All right, cool. So um, I have to admit, when we wrote the questions, we were thinking there would be a little bit more secondary primary spread, but that's okay. Um, so. We want to start by looking at where we currently are. Um, preferably something that you've gone, this is cool, I've done this, even if you might think that it doesn't seem that exciting. Uh, what, what have you been doing in education with technology that you think, this is kind of cool, I'm proud of this, somebody else should know about it? 
I like to talk a lot, so watch me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess as a parent, um, a young parent, I'm young and my children are young, um, they are in primary school, so um, I, I guess being on the other end and using um, um, primary school apps such as um, Seesaw are awesome because as a working parent, I feel like I'm connected to my child's learning journey, um, so I get daily updates, so I think it's a really neat um, application to use in primary schools. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what Seesaw is for those of us yeah, who do so not have primary children? Yeah, so if you don't children? know what it is, um, my perspective is that um, it's a two-way communication tool, so quite often it starts with um, works being posted at the primary school level, so it's either the children taking photos or videos to sort of celebrate what they're doing in the classroom, and then they post it on Seesaw, and then I get an alert that there's something being posted, and I can look at it, view it, um, it's moderated, so all the, um, the parents are in the group. Um, so before my, my comment goes live, it's moderated by the teacher and then it goes live. So they get that two-way um, communication plus the child gets, you know, get gratitude and encouragement from their parents or, or whanau um, as their works are, are put online. So it's really neat. Yeah, and then it's also used as a notice board as well. So if there's notices for the schools to go out, they pop them on there too. Cool. Is anybody else doing anything or receiving anything because they're on the other side? Um, hello everyone, I'm Madeline Campbell. I work for Core Education, um, but I live in Hokitika and I taught at Westland High School for a few years and then mid-2015 I started working with Core Education and the Tokipanamu Education Trust. Um, that is currently in 15 schools between Hokitika Greymouth, Grey Valley, Reefton. Um, and I'm really excited about the program because um, from the outset it seems like one-to-one -one devices, Chromebooks everywhere, Google everywhere, but in fact it's a change to the way schools work with students and how they teach. Um, quite a big shift to pedagogy, which just means ways of going about teaching and learning and we've seen some really exciting results. And for me, the focus that it's all about making the most of the internet and what technology has to offer, that's really exciting. So teachers have all been learning how to design their own websites, make all of their teaching and learning completely public. Um, the students go through a cyber smart program, so there's a focus on being smart and knowing what to do rather than just being terrified. Um, and they all have their own blogs and the idea is that their blog is completely public and unmoderated and they learn how to manage that and work with all of that and that's where they share what they create to show what they've learned um, and they learn how to comment on each other's blogs so they learn how to um, actually comment and share in real life in thoughtful, caring, respectful ways which is um, pretty cool. I talk to the kids a lot about, you know, your parents and we never learned how to actually communicate properly on the internet so that's been really really exciting there's quite a lot to it there's a lot of um, like equity and inclusion is a really big focus um, so the trust was set up to enable um, any family to access a device um, and that's that's in a nutshell I hear all these stories and we don't have this at our school and I'm like, how did you set it up to have equity of access to devices? Um, that goes a bit into where the program came from. Um, if you're in education, you might have heard of Manaya Kalani Education Trust and they're a trust in Auckland that works in the Glen Innes community and that was a spin-off of an economic program within the Glen Innes, Glen Innes community which was about community development and improvement. Um, they have mostly very low decile schools. It was a community that was once quite wealthy with uh, lots of factory work and there was massive downturn as all that type of thing changed. And the education programs that were coming out of the government weren't working for those kids. They were just keeping them below the line and um, not serving what they needed. So they developed their, their own education program and trust and ways to use technology and explored that over a 10 year period. And it was so successful for them, the trust, which is basically a whole heap of really wealthy businessmen, businessmen around the Auckland area and things like um, Next Foundation, 
amongst other things. Spark was involved for a while too. Um, they worked out a way to actually enable those families which have, um, I think, an average income of about 19000 to be able to afford a device. So that's why, that, why they do the one device only, um, so that they can really leverage that in terms of ordering. Um, does that answer the question? Start to answer it? Yeah, yeah and that's, that trust basically thought, well, if it works so well for the, our kids here, what could happen around the rest of New Zealand? Um, so there's now, the first three years, there were five clusters of schools from Christchurch here in West Coast um, and up north and in Auckland. And just this year, because that pilot was so successful, they've rolled out to five more clusters around um, Gisborne, Wellington, as well as the other places as well. And so the model is really working for those communities. Is, because I, uh, I'm from Auckland, so I heard about <laughs> Renai Kalani. Is there anywhere that we, they're keeping like stories of what's been going on and how successful, could I'll you put a website, hand I'll that to, yep, yep, that'd be awesome, because yep. I think that there are lots of things that we can learn off of mm, that. Absolutely. And we only have, <laughs> cool. Anyone else doing or seen or experienced anything that they're like, that's quite cool happening in the education sector at the moment? I'm not a teacher, but I'm a parent who volunteers um, with a group of us running a code club in our school. It's not a rural school, but it is um, Desol 2 in, in a city. Um, and we roped together people who knew technology and came in and we teach one class a week. Um, the teacher um, can sit back and relax and, um, and um, they, they vary from class to class and some of them get really involved, some of them don't. Um, and we teach um, children um, how to do programming. We did the first year of Scratch and then we moved on to embedded um, micro bits that came from um, Britain, where I believe in Britain they've, they've funded them by the government, um, whereas we had to self-fund. Um, in fact, it's the parents the parents who run the co-club paying for most of it, to be frank. Um, and we, we bought embedded devices and they can program them and build gadgets. That's cool. I, I have, have looked at the micro bits things and I was wondering what they were like. Has anyone else seen something that they like that is quite cool? Okay, so maybe if we have a look at the other side, which is why are we not doing more cool things? Uh, what do you think some of the barriers are to us being able to do cool things in technology that help our kids with education? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have to do the microphone thing here. <laughs> mindset. Wait, yeah. Elaborate, I mean, I what do you mean? Well, elaborate. I think it's only a mindset. We can do whatever we want to do, eh? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the need. Where is the need? So are you talking about mindset with the kids, educators, those in charge? Oh, those in charge. Yep. <laughs> 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 uh, yep. Okay, so I'm not going to say which school I'm from so I can talk about it. Um, I, I find it, it, there's a lot of a massive pushback that any time you, you want to do something, there's, you're not being respectful of teachers' time. They've already got an overcrowded school with you know 45 kids in a class. Um, they're tired. They don't want to do anything more than what they're already doing now. And if that's mindset and it's reality. Uh, in our circumstance at tertiary level, I, I think the biggest impediment is actually resource mm -hmm. um, and skill. So we can see what needs to happen, and it's, it's being done out there really intelligently by private enterprise. Uh, but when we try to do it, we tend to be just taking what we already do and then dumping it into a digital platform rather than changing the way that we deliver it. Because changing the way we deliver it means filming time. It means it having interacting differently with the resources and that. And we don't have the capability or resource to do that. So we're just transferring from one method to another that in terms of the educative quality, is um, no different than sitting down someone in a dark room and reading a book. Yeah, um, coming from industry into education, there does seem to be like, if you do a wholesale change, like when Spark have said they've moved to Agile, they actually allow a whole amount of time for training and development. Um, while they still continue doing business, there is that time set aside, whereas in education, uh, the ability to set that time aside 
is not so much there. You still have to turn up in front of your kids every single day, still planning for what you're supposed to be doing. You don't have the time to do things like filming, prep. Um, I guess from a primary school PTA perspective, um, and recently putting a whole bunch of money in fundraising, you know, selling sausages, it's that, that hard, um, to buy our kids iPads. Um, and that's just a core set. So I think it's a funding issue as well. Um, the schools, um, especially if it's a change like the decile of a school gets changed, it's a huge mm -hmm. impact on um, their funding. So for us at a small um, school here on the West Coast, it's not having the resource, so the parents have got to go out and sell sausages to get the technology. And then I guess it's um, getting the right skill set or um, PD for the people that are here um, to equip them with being able to use the devices or the technology. Yeah. Do you think there's anything that's unique to the West Coast that's putting a barrier in, or do you think these are the same kind of barriers that schools and education is facing across New Zealand? Yeah. So you mentioned PD, which I can find in my city school, um, but we can't find relievers for those days. Um, there just aren't any to be had. Do you guys have relievers available so you can even do PD? Yes. You do? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, one I of I the benefits them? of okay. being quite isolated is that um, they're our relievers, <laughs> they don't go anywhere else. So like I say, Westport has four schools in total. That's cool. Yeah. Certainly from a tertiary perspective, that's often a, a one of our issues is that we have um, one tutor, one program. Um, if we're lucky, we might have one and a bit tutors, <laughs> um, but it's almost impossible to get cover and, and then for the person to come back and have the time to create um, as Ian said, some of the, the package that needs to go in behind it, and so it is, it's both a time and a, and a resource and a, and a kind of a training issue in tertiary. Right. I'm hot on collaboration, and I guess um, there's a real opportunity. We've got um, some really talented people in our region, and it feels like um, me looking in, and it may not be the right perspective, but it's just one that I, I've sort of come to, um, is that everyone's sort of doing some pockets of stuff um, and potentially doing it quite well, um, but then there's some real gaps at other schools as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe if it was a more of a collaborative approach to particularly stuff like um, technology, um, we might make some further strides. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but yeah. I mean, there's some talented people at certain schools that I'm sure other schools yep. would jump at the chance to have. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can work together somehow. Well, that actually quite nicely leads us into the second half, which is about looking to the future. So our magic wand has been waved and we've sorted out most of these issues. Fantastic. <laughs> um, how could we use things like technology to better educate our kids? What you know, whether it's at primary school, secondary, or in tertiary, what kind of things, thinking about like the internet of things, one-to-one um, -one devices, what kind of things could you see happening that would go, that is really gonna do great things for our young people? Um, just one that I'd reflect on is that the way that uh, schools in the US have rolled Khan Academy into classrooms. Mm. So that that's the delivery method where the teacher's sitting there getting live data as students are sitting there doing their work and is able to intercede at the point where the student actually has a problem and uh, intercede directly with that student at the, in, a, in a timely fashion rather than teaching everybody, everybody's learning at their own pace and the teacher becomes part of that process in terms of, of, of finding where they're getting stuck and moving them on and allowing others to go at a different pace to, to work further ahead. Mm. Um, that seems to me that that's that whole internet of things of that, of getting live data, being able to actually analyse it and then being able to interact with it in a, in a meaningful way so they're not left alone in a room and the teacher is there as a teacher still, but is there teaching based on absolute need at the time rather than just generically to a whole classroom. That's cool. <laughs> what else? Um, I'm a bit of an, I guess, creativity freak, so I'm really interested in how um, we can actually use or use the internet for being creative rather than and move 
mm. sort of quite explicitly or get a more explicit understanding of the difference between consumption and creation um, so that people can be a lot more empowered. And I'm also really mindful of the internet perpetrating certain cultural models. Yep. Is that a way to put it? <laughs> and how we can actually, you, you know, there's huge scope there to actually work out how we use the internet in ways that actually um, help us focus on each other's humanity, I don't know, um, if that's a way of putting it. So allow people to learn who they are as individuals within their own cultural context and within their own communities and actually be really empowered from where they live. I guess that's an understanding of, mm. you know, we're isolated here, but in fact we can have it all. We don't have to go away. Just building on that, it made me think of the um, the makerspace concept. Like, so you've got some people that are, you know, really um, creative, but maybe aren't internet savvy or aren't mechanical savvy, um, in the same room or space, I guess, as people that are. So it's you need both to make things work on the internet, <laughs> you know, bring it together. So um, maybe there is an opportunity for us to look at, um, you know, could there be a makerspace on the west coast? Um, you know, they've certainly been set up all around the country and seem to be working quite well. Um, and youth, um, particularly, are crying out for a space to hang out and let their creative and innovative sort of juices flow. So um, maybe that's a potential question mark. Since you mentioned Makerspace, I'll throw another buzzword. Um, Fab Lab is the, an, an alternative to the movement that acknowledges things like knitting and crochet have always been making and should be in there with your arc welding. Mm. Obviously, it's another movement to look at. Yep. Um, um, being a librarian, my, my aspect is um, that libraries are a great space for makerspaces and the like. Um, currently, I'm in uh, Canterbury. And with the new library, there's just an amazing amount of technology going in there. Um, and I know things are happening here and in, in, um, across the West Coast libraries, but it's just a really good um, space for those that are not necessarily able to get the internet at home or, or that. So, yeah, coding clubs and libraries, things like that, really useful. And maybe we should be looking at education, like our more traditional education spaces, reaching outside their education spaces, making use of their public zones as well. Um, so I came from a secondary setting and it was really interesting for me moving into working with primary schools. Um, and something that happened on the west coast a wee bit before the time that I got here was so many schools were closed down and consolidated. Um, so there were lots of rebuilds of schools. So I was like blown away by how nice and modern most of the primary schools were compared to the high schools. Um, but they've all been built with what they call tech spaces and those spaces are pretty underutilised so there is actually spaces within those schools that will hopefully start to be more utilised especially with the new strand to the technology curriculum because the technology, the digital technologies part of the technology curriculum is all about making, amongst other things, you, you know, learning why things work but also making stuff to explore that. Something I've seen work quite well in Christchurch as well is the um, with the Fab Lab concept, and it doesn't have doesn't really matter which which um, we're talking about. But um, some of the kids coming in are often quite young, so they're starting about nine or ten, coming in and using the space, um, developing a whole lot of skills and quite a range of skills, um, and then those. Um, children going back into their schools often at year nine and ten as they're progressing through and actually starting to run their own you know, the equivalent of coding club or or um, areas that they're experts at and so bringing the, the, the younger generation through and, the, and they're close enough to those guys that it's, they do some really cool projects um, and that's something that's worked really well and could easily work um, here too. So we've got the magic wand. What What does the magic wand look like for you? Is it more money? Is it um, more people? Better people? Um, like, if the magic wand was presented to you, what would your what would your magic wand produce or deliver in order to enable these kinds of things? Uh, 
Um, it's more, more, of a, more of a question, actually. So in terms of what I've noticing, and especially in the last couple of years, getting the first generation of high school students coming through who have been pretty much fully invested in, in digital technologies as part of their education, started on Chromebooks maybe at primary school um, in, in year eight and have been right through. Um, and there's something missing from it somewhere in the system on the way through and the way that we're educating. There's something about literacy, literacy numeracy is not improving. It's getting it's getting harder. So and that makes it difficult. Suddenly the the transition from secondary to tertiary. Another thing as well, socially in that uh, I think that they're, they're much better adjusted. Um, they're easier to have relationships with, but they know what to think, but they don't know how to think. And pushing people how to think seems to put them under enormous amounts of pressure that they then fold under. And somewhere with all of this stuff we're doing, because when I hear about the spaces that the ladies over here are talking about, they seem to me like they should be the spaces where they are developing those skills about how to think and exploring their creativity and that, but it's not flowing through yet to what I'm seeing at a first year, at a tertiary level, I'm talking, say, level three coming straight from high school. So somewhere in there, there's a, there's a, there, there needs to be, I don't know if it's a fix or what it is, but there's a, there's a disconnect. Sorry, I'll just keep yapping. Mick was said she could yap, but probably <laughs> I can too. Um, <laughs> Um, I was just it's Rex, wasn't it? Yeah, I was just talking to Rex before about the gap that I'm seeing sort of year eleven up and under that year eleven age group and I've got that gap in my stepdaughters and the two younger ones are playing around with code and they taught themselves how to code with different things so that they could make stuff in Minecraft when they were little. Whereas the older two will come to us and go, oh, I don't know how to do that. So they, that problem-solving mindset and seeing a problem and working it out for themselves was kind of, it's not there for the older ones, but it's there for the younger ones. And I'll be really interested to see what happens. Um, I know it's, you know you can't change education overnight, but I'll be really interesting to s re interested to see how, how things change over the next five years with those kids that you start seeing coming through. So those kids that have started on Chromebooks or other devices from like year four or five, um, focusing on being creative with how they use the technology. Yeah, I'm just really intrigued. I guess I'll have to stick it out in education for a bit longer <laughs> so I get to see them coming through. Um, the other thing I was just thinking of was partnerships. Mm. Partnerships are starting to change in communities. I know in Hokitika, um, there's a, a maker space being developed at Westland High School. Um, that is a sort of community partnership as well to get all those things going. And I know it's been in the pipeline for years, but something's starting to shift around how people come together from different sectors to actually try and make things happen. Um, just to add to what um, Madeline said about that sort of gap from year 11 up, I'm at Buller High School with Jessica and um, we've tried to introduce just to our senior school the greater use of technology as we try and address equity issues within our school, within our community. But it's really apparent that our, uh, one of the gaps with our senior students is that they're very risk averse. Um, I don't know if that's peculiar to our kids or kids in lots of other places. Um, you know, outside of Jessica's robotics and co-clubs, our kids in terms of technology um, are using it in very traditional manners in terms of uh, word processing, etc. cetera, um, because they're kind of like too afraid to sort of like take risks because their problem solving skills with the technology aren't there. Whereas our younger students are much more adventurous. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's because there's been um, a gap for those kids in that current sort of 15 to 18 age range haven't quite had the, the skill set um, that our younger students are now coming through with. Um, hopefully it will change in the future. Cheers. Yeah, I think there is a shift um, as we realise how much screen time our kids are actually spending um, from uh, consumption to creation. I know it's something I push heavily with my robotics kids is you, you're not here to play games. <laughs> you can do that at home. You're about creation here. And I think that may help explain the gap 
is these kids have come up with consumption because we didn't think it was any different than watching TV. Um, and there is a shift now around, you're not just here to play games, you're actually here to do something with your device that benefits the world. It would be quite interesting seeing that further shift to you're not just doing something that's interesting and fun, but you're actually going to do something that benefits the world now. Um, so if we think about the future, five years from now, what's our education going to look like from primary through to tertiary, five years from now and then ten years from now? What? Hopefully it won't be the same. <laughs> I guess soon we'll find out what our future may hold, um, you know, post-announcement of the 2020 roadmap. Mm. Um, however, I hope that it's um, a bit more seamless, so there's not, um, it, it, you can flow a little bit more in between um, primary and high school and high school and tertiary, so it's, it's a, a nice continuum. Mm. Um, and I hope there is more collaboration, um, sharing of resources, skills, um, and it just astounds me, I think, you know, on a small community like the West Coast that we do work in isolation, um, that maybe we have um, a plan of attack for our region, um, identify where our needs are, and, um, you know, together, you know, make it a better place to live and play and learn. <laughs> Um, so to add to what Meek was saying here, what, what is <coughs> it strikes me about even this little gathering here is apart from possibly Gina and a little bit of what I do, everybody here is in, in education already where in fact we're as industry um, yeah. because they are the biggest um, stakeholders in this in terms of what we do um, and also they are in the same position that we're in where their businesses are changing exponentially exponential growth, exponential changes in technology, which is what we've just been to, and they're going to be required to be on board with this as well. So somehow that integration of the secondary tertiary sector with industry is, I think, the, the key to actually driving this, because then they come on board as partners and funders as well, which yes. sounds like is, is happening in a couple of places already as well, because they're invested in it, but they're not here today. I just, um, I guess on that, I mean, Taipotani Polytech is starting to blur the lines between, I guess, um, tertiary and industry as well, so it's not just stopping, I should have probably elaborated a little bit more, but it's not just stopping at tertiary full stop, see you later. Um, it's sort of blurring the lines and getting them into industry and it might be a blur of both. Um, so we're starting work on that and hope to see some um, strides next year in that space. I'd love to see more of the initiatives, like have you guys heard of Inspiral Dev Academy? No, okay, blank faces. Um, they're, they're mostly funded by, um, lots of things, TPK, but um, they've done, they, what they do is they retrain adults, so you've got a career um, receptionist, office manager, whatever, and you're like, I don't want to do this anymore, and I'm pushing 40, and you come and do a three-month boot camp, and then I hire them, I hire so many of them, and they're really, really good programmers, so I'd like more of these, um, they're being funded by Nati Puro and some government money at a Tairo Fidi out Gisborne, Gizzy way, um, and some more things like that, so people can do a three-month boot camp, and then go back to Greymouth, and keep working um, because in technology you don't need to be sitting in Lambton Key, you can be sitting in Greymouth and be incredibly productive and, and lucrative. Um, I guess Taipotani is also looking at you know, that idea and I guess sort of the micro-credentialing and stuff as well for the future, um, so that's definitely on the radar um, and we are very conscious that our young people are leaving well, a lot of our young people are leaving the West Coast, so we're looking at um, initiatives of, you know, of, of ways to try and keep them here and retain them. So exactly what you're saying. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. 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 On the retention, uh, the, the kids I work with in robotics and Code Club uh, often want to leave, mm. not necessarily because they want to leave Westport, uh, but because they don't see that they can get a job there in the industry that they're into. They kind of see Westport does farming and mining and it doesn't do a technology, right? which is really great that we have um, Epic, the Epic Centre and Vertigo because it, I can start going, guys, you don't have to leave, you can come back. Some of them, they don't want to leave. Their family's there, they, they like being near people they know, they like being around a small town, but they're just seeing that they can't stay because there's nowhere for them to stay. So the links with industry are going to really, really help giving our kids who don't traditionally fit on the West Coast a reason to stay. Just, hey, 
technology is the third largest um, export in New Zealand, and it's only getting bigger. Yeah, I'm Rex from Chorus, but just on a, a private note, a um, parent of two children that left university with no idea what they wanted to do because they had no idea when they went. Um, are we not planning or taking kids through career path planning early enough so that they can actually see a future and shape what the learning needs to be and where it can go, rather than um, in my generation it was you had to go to university uh, and get a degree and then you'll be off. Um, now, seven, seven careers in a, in a person's working life, um, maybe we should be helping kids understand their power and their, their possibilities earlier so that they can actually start grasping technology and learning. Um, I'll give it to you after me, you know, I told you I'm a microphone hog. Um, <laughs> so, it's not the world of typo here, but we are um, conscious of that and we are in the middle of developing a web application um, that will be part of a, um, I guess, a career coaching tool that you'll be able to use in schools and that typo here will assist um, our West Coast community initially um, with helping um, students or more kids, I guess, um, find out what pushes their buttons and what they're into and I guess um, help them on the uh, on the career journey. And it might, it's not going to be a once you're in, we'll leave you alone. We want to be part of their life forever. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting um, new web application that's coming your way very soon. So yeah. Um, I work on the careers team at uh, Buller High School. Um, we use the the careers uh, benchmarks that have been written um, from year seven upwards. So we liaise with the primary schools as well to sort of like help them uh, introduce sort of careers work with um, you know students from year seven not on. Um, at our school for years nine to thirteen, um, all of our students produce a careers portfolio, um, looking at you know kind of like what their skills and qualities are, where they're at now, and it, um, a layer is added at each year level. Um, and we have a particular push with our year twelves in terms of their sort of like future career planning because quite often if you go and check out a tertiary institution or something like that at year 13 it's too late um, or kids you know what we discovered was that halfway through year 13 our kids were sort of changing their minds and go oh I now need physics and so we're checking out summer school options at universities and things like that so we sort of took a step back and thought well actually if our kids were sort of like making more informed decisions from year 12 onwards, then we could put sort of like the ambulance at the top of the cliff rather than the bottom. Um, my impression is that schools, both primary and secondary, are very dedicated towards career planning, but there's a shortage of resources, skills, funding and time. Hi, just a uh, perspective of my own experience. Um, my son wanted to go into graphic design and um, my husband at the time was quite um, quite adamant being a West Coaster that that wasn't a real job that would actually... So what I'm, what I'm saying, I mean, he's done very well in his web designing now, um, but um, that perception of West Coast, I'm dubious to say this, but I think there's a, a gap in the appearance of sort of my age um, and a bit less that I don't, don't understand the, the, the um, potential of um, internet and what it can do. So maybe appearance, education um, and just including them more maybe in that in that career path to, to say that there, there is the work there and there will be certainly in the future. Um, over at my um, undescribed day job, we did a, a what we called a discovery on the life event of entering tertiary study. And there was a massive report. One thing stuck in my mind was the phrase, childhood decisions with adult repercussions. And the way we've set it up is you get to year 13 and realise you haven't done physics. In year 12, you'll never be a scientist. 
and that's not how human brains work. I mean, you, the, the idea that you didn't make this decision when you're 15, you can't be a scientist when you're 25. Um, the system is set up to funnel you this way. Um, and I really love how the tech industry is admitting you can learn how to do this in three months. The fact that you didn't take maths in fifth form, we don't care. Um, and I'd love more of this, the, the acknowledgement human brains are malleable, you can learn stuff your entire life. Yeah, I've found um, kids come to robotics quite late. Um, I still have parents of very young children who don't know what coding and programming is. And I'm like, but you're my age. How have you got to this and you don't know what this... I mean, you might not know how to do it, that's fine, but you should know what programming means. And I think there is a real gap around educating parents that we sit there and play with stuff, but there is a real job out of this, and that's one of the things that we do when we go away on competitions. Uh, we visit tertiary institutions to say, this is what you could do when you leave school, and we also visit companies to say, this is the kind of work environment and things that you could be doing. Um, it would be great to see other trips that leave the West Coast to do that as well, to give kids more exposure, because I know that, you know, Taipatini is our closest tertiary, but a lot of our kids go a heck of a lot further afield, and it's the first time they may set foot on a tertiary institution's grounds is when they actually end up there for the first time, which is something that is quite unique to rural environments. But what else could we do that would help prepare our kids for technology in the world, technology in education, those kinds of things? I'm Joey and I'm a youth worker here on the coast. Um, I think for the West Coast, like one of our biggest barriers is like we've obviously there's a there's a lot of the like older not to be rude or anything, but a lot of the older generation here on the coast who are so opposed to change, mm -hmm. they're stuck in the old ways. Like how are we meant to, you know, make a change and like be progressing forward when people don't want people don't want to know they they're comfortable. Um, and so they don't want to change, and I think that's one of our biggest barriers towards moving forward technology ways um, here on the coast. Yeah, I'm fortunate enough to, to be in a, in a company that sponsors or, or supports flexible working. I'm just wondering if there's a future for flexible learning, mm -hmm. more remote classrooms. Um, just because you live on the coast, it doesn't mean you can't benefit from the resources that are available uh, in another major centre or internationally. Um, technology can enable a lot of that sort of thing. Um, that's just reminded me, like through New Zealand, um, in secondary and primary school, we've got basically an online schools network but even that has quite low uptake because I, when I was still teaching, I ran an art history course online um, because there was no art history on the West Coast. But I also found that I had students from Auckland and all around the place as well that joined that. Um, but I think there's huge potential in that approach to learning. Um, and there's been big strides forward with that because um, you're no longer tied to a single room to access video conferencing. Um, and one of my stepdaughters shoots home after lunch on a Wednesday, because we've got really good internet, and that's where she does her online class in history. Um, so, yeah, especially for coast secondaries, um, being able to access any part of the curriculum, whether you have a timetable clash at school or not, is hugely powerful. So yeah, we'll be interested to see how that how that can possibly grow. I'd um, just like to pick up and run with a comment over here from over here, the lady in the red top there from Gisborne, is it? Um, could, couldn't agree more with what you said, um, is that I, I wonder if as educationists we're still too focused on this idea of pathways all the time mm -hmm. and people determining where they're going to be in a future that they don't know or they don't understand that we don't know or we don't understand. Um, I still think the most powerful speech given on that is Sir Ken Robinson's TED talk from, from years ago about how schools are killing our creativity. And on top of that, we have a, an, an industrial um, response to that already with uh, PwC, I think, a couple of years ago, 
when they brought out that ma that um, that framework for interviewing for chief executives in New Zealand's top 100 companies, where all the emphasis now is on measuring psychometric testing and measuring emotional intelligence, and a whole lot less about qualification means less and less because what they were finding is that you know if you've been in if you did your qualification at university 20 years ago that actually m most of what you learned is no longer relevant anyway so they're interested in people who are adaptable and can go and do the little boot course and continue learning and keep on developing so I wonder if our continuous focus on creating pathways because we have to keep bums on seats and people have to know where they're going I wonder if we're part of the problem. Yeah we certainly talk about training people for yesterday um, in the tertiary sector. Um, just another point, um, I didn't make it clear, I'm from the West Coast but working at Lincoln University at the moment. Um, I'm a big um, proponent for open education resources and I think the, the fostering the love of learning and the lifelong learning thing is just a key um, for parents as well as the, the students. Um, and so yeah, with the open education resources, um, I mean, for, for instance, at the moment, I'm doing a um, Creative Commons course from America. Um, you know, the ability to do that and be adaptive is just fantastic. So um, Lincoln University has an open, open access research archive, and I think um, putting more out there that's available to anybody is just amazing. Yeah. Are, are there any iwi-based pathways out of here to or for here while staying here? No. For the tourism sector, that's that's the, the average wage in tourism is lower than the national average wage, so it, it's not going to raise it. Okay, living wage, sweet, but because oh sweet, because there's some really transformative stuff I've seen in lots of regional things, and when it's iwi based, because that they are really focused on the place that they're in in a way that central government just isn't. So it sounds like a lot of things are saying that actually as uh, educational institutes we need to take the walls down, whether that's to let people in or to let information out. It could be quite interesting, say, coming to an educational institution in 10 years and seeing what that looks like. If you're able to think for a moment and put yourself into a younger person's shoes, <laughs> how do you think you would feel walking into that kind of place with those kinds of experiences? It's obviously the hard question, that Jessica. <laughs> Um, I find um, I often have to remind colleagues that we are educating kids for the world that they're growing up in, not the one we grew up in. Um, and yet the physical um, and educational structures of, for example, high schools, um, which I think in many respects are way behind primary schools, um, are, are just kind of like not necessarily set up for the world that our kids are growing up in and going into. Um, for example, high schools are still very much um, organised in silos by sort of curriculum areas. And there are a number of um, secondary schools around the country that are, are now looking at sort of kind of more project-based learning across curriculum and co-curricular stuff. Um, where it kind of mimics more the real world because um, High schools seem to be becoming out of step with primary and tertiary. Um, but it's quite hard getting some people to kind of like change their approach. Um, and I think, you know, like I, I was often um, told when I was training, every now and again, step into your own classroom with the mindset of one of your students. Would you like what you see? I think maybe we need to do that a little bit more.
Um, my daughter's in a school where they have pulled down the walls, literally, and had a big open classroom. Um, and for me, I was a little bit nervous because she, they've done it um, in, a pri in the first couple of years, the first two years or three years of um, a primary school, rather than at the other end, which is a bit more traditional, I believe. Um, so for me, it was kind of like, oh my God, is this going to work? Is she going to be okay? It's a bit untested. Um, do I put my child in a different school? Like, you know, and it's a bit of a concern as a parent um, with some of this untested waters. You've kind of got to go with the flow, but then at the same time, you don't really want your child to be the guinea pig. Um, so, I mean, fortunately for her, she's thriving. She's just one of those kids. But, um, yeah, I would like to know a little bit more about it anyway. Like, I hope that people are looking at it, testing it against um, traditional classrooms, seeing if it is actually working and it just doesn't look pretty. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things I haven't been brave enough to say in front of groups of teachers yet is um, if you were a student and you walked into a, into a classroom and your teacher was illiterate, would that be all right with you? And it's, you know, if you walk into a classroom and you have a teacher that is digitally illiterate, mm -hmm. is that okay? Yeah, I know that's... <laughs> I haven't quite gone that as far yet <laughs> to <laughs> challenge... <laughs> Um, people, because they're you know, the, people have put gone through huge growth. The teachers that I've been working with, but I think that's still a real challenge. Um, we can't have teachers that are digitally illiterate for our students and what they need. Yeah. I'd also put out there: uh, are our students as digitally literate as we think they are? Because the number of kids who I have to teach how to send an email with an attachment at quite senior levels is quite horrific. <laughs> um, and I think that is something that uh, as schools we're quite often told, it's okay, the kids will help you. I'm like actually 90% of teachers are more digitally literate than their students because we have to be in order to use the systems that our school uses, whether that's email or Word or even Excel. So it is something I think to keep in mind are these kids actually that digitally literate? literate? That's a word, isn't it? They can use their phones. Some of them can code. Uh, it tends to be an optional rather than a compulsory. Um, it would be interesting, yeah, seeing from more of a tertiary s perspective, are you guys finding that as well? Or is it that we have actually got them through something? <laughs> Oh, I completely agree with you. We have to teach them how to use PowerPoint, Word, Excel, how to send emails, how to send attachments. What they are is socially media um, savvy, really, really savvy. But even using even really foundational stuff like how to utilise a search engine properly to find information, they try once, they say, I can't find it. You go and put the right question, you go, here we go, there's, there's 3,000 answers to your question here and not even knowing how to frame that question correctly to get that information. And I would say that would be... That's not anecdotally just a few students, that's by far the majority. Yeah, um, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur when it comes to technology, okay, I'll admit that. Um, and I think what we really are facing is if we are in a trade which is associated with tertiary education as in politics, um, really trying to find the balance between conveying the skills of the trade as well as all these issues that have come up is a hell of a challenge actually because uh, suddenly where are we? Are we actually there to, to teach the trade or are we there to teach uh, technology and um, where do we sit? Where do we need to sit uh, for let's say cooking a meal in, in the case where I'm associated with you know, uh, technology is in the kitchen as well, but in the end it's the cooking skills, so where do you find the balance? I've been out of the university sector, I studied like, a lot of years ago, um, but I came out not knowing how to do that stuff, so I was really fortunate that the places I worked um, provided me with professional development, or my colleagues were fortunately enough to work here, um, where it was at my, at my um, fingertips, I guess, but a lot of people go away and study, but you don't learn those core technology skills. Just like we're having issues with um, people, well, children or students coming through without those basic um, numeracy and literacy skills, we're also finding at the other end that they're coming out of tertiary study 
with potentially not um, having basic um, digital skills. So yeah, there's a gap, there's a couple of gaps. Um, I think like for myself, so I finished high school two years ago and I was sort of in high school during that awkward time where they were like bringing in lots of technology um, and but we were so used to doing it how we were doing it that a lot of us like, you know, didn't rebel against it but you know like we weren't, you know, like not super tech savvy like I know how to send an email or whatever, like, you know, like I'm, I'm not stupid but um, yeah, so I think for a lot like for the ones coming through tertiary studies now, it's because we didn't have that that grounding foundation of technology right through. Like we went through primary school doing book work, not working off of computers, and so it was a big change trying at the end of our like you know secondary school to try and bring in all of this technology when we're like, well, that's not what we're used to, sort of thing. So I think so. You know, so now, like, the ones that are starting to come through because they'll have that foundation, like, it'll be less of an issue. Yeah. Sorry. Cool. Okay, um, in a previous job, I um, took technology to schools in the developing world, and we had a lot of successes, but we had one really dramatic failure where the village assembled the laptops in the middle of the square and set them on fire. Um, and it was a really good lesson from a bunch of Pakeha from Wellington to not do it that way. Um, you ha can't bring technology at a community. You have to do it with a community. And there's no way one size fits all, even in a country as small as New Zealand. We, we need to do it appropriate to where it's going. All right, uh, we are out of time. Um, if you want to carry on conversing, uh, I believe morning tea is now, so find the person who you want to chat with. Um, hopefully you've had something that sparked something that you will be able to take back to wherever you are from and inspire others. And do we need to do anything else? No, I was just Okay, there you go. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you to our excellent facilitators.